Good morning and welcome to Food Safety for the Backyard Poultry Producer. My name is Stuart Vermack. I'm the Food Safety Extension Agent in Loudoun County with Virginia Cooperative Extension. And this presentation is run in conjunction with the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services and their poultry and veterinary program. So today we're going to speak about um, some of the benefits of, of having backyard poultry and then some things we need to, to know to reduce our risk of getting ourselves sick and then also getting our own flock sick. So why have backyard poultry? Well, obviously you might want to produce your own eggs, whether those are duck eggs or, or chicken eggs. This is a great way to, to do that. You might want to then sell those eggs and we'll speak about that at the end of the presentation. This is a great way to, to learn about where your food comes from, um, expose your family um, to, to that as well and, and learn a bit about agriculture. You might want to introduce a new pet to the family and we'll speak about some of the pros and cons of that. So how can we get sick from poultry? Uh, well, uh, zoonotic diseases are those diseases that are passed from animals to humans. Okay, we've seen those uh, with the swine flu, uh, many other flu, uh, COVID-19 as well. And so it's the same thing when we speak about um, salmonella, which is the most common zoonotic disease that can be uh, passed from, from poultry to humans. Uh, it's found in the intestinal tract and many different strains exist of this salmonella. Um, most of them are not harmful to us, but there are a few that, that are and are linked to poultry in particular. And the poultry themselves uh, and, and their eggs are gonna be that uh, predominant reservoir for where that salmonella is going to be existing. Okay, it, it seems, and we'll see in a second with some um, data that those seem to be increasing and young poultry seem to be particularly susceptible to that salmonella. This is a study that was done um, by the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, and it looks back since 1990 up until 2016 on salmonella related, uh, salmonella outbreaks related to live poultry. It's important to note that this is related to live poultry. This is not to improper cooking of chicken this is to poultry while it is, is still live, okay? So as you can see uh, in the table, uh, in the graph rather, uh, those incidences, those outbreaks have, have seemingly increased um, and it's resulted in six deaths since 1990 with nearly 4,000 people becoming ill, 661 having to go to the hospital. Uh, a recent outbreak that happened of salmonella due to live poultry was in the fall of 2017 there were 961 cases and, and one death did occur. And you'll see in this image here that Virginia um, actually had the highest reported cases with 56. Um, there were a number of other states, states involved in it, but, but Virginia had the most. So it's, it's relevant to us here. Okay, so what causes people to get sick um, and other diseases, not just salmonella? Well, really, it's contact with anything that those poultry animals might uh, might be coming into contact with. And so obviously the droppings is the main concern as it's found in the gastrointestinal tract, but we'll see later that their eggs are also susceptible to it. Um, but you know, their feathers, their feet, anytime you get into contact with, with their environment is really a, a chance for, for this to happen. So we're gonna speak about four things um, that we can do to reduce the chance of infection. First one being maintaining the egg laying environment. We're gonna then look at the production practices with eggs, the handling practices with those eggs, and then personal hygiene. All right, so the very first way that we can proactively reduce the risk of us getting sick as a result um, of a, a disease that's related to poultry is to maintain their environment. If we can keep it as clean as possible, then they're laying in a clean environment. And so, you know, there's a lot of specifics with this, but providing adequate space is very important. Uh, we want to provide them enough floor space, roof space, enough for them to be walking around, uh, to be laying their eggs. We want to make sure that their feet is, their water is, all those things are as clean as possible to keep that environment nice and clean. Okay, with their nest boxes, um, it's also important to control pests, obviously. That's a, a large challenge with, with poultry. Importantly, and we'll speak about this a little bit later when we speak about biosecurity. But when we're talking about cleaning and sanitizing uh, the equipment, that's a really important step. 
if you're if you're maybe you're retiring some laying birds and you're bringing some new ones in, uh, it's important that you uh, clean and sanitize the equipment and the coop because if you don't, then any potential pathogens, any things that might be in the environment um, that that original flock was able to handle, this new flock might not be able to, particularly if they are young. Okay, so some production practices, um, once we've set up a good environment. Importantly, you obviously only wanna be purchasing your chicks and, um, and your feed from reliable sources, but it's also important to, to raise those chickens in isolation from other poultry when you get new ones. Okay, so uh, when you, you, you get those new birds and maybe you wanna boost the numbers of your flock, it's important that you quarantine them for two to three weeks. And the reason for this is that you're, you know, you're unaware if you get that new, new bird in or maybe um, a, a group of them, you don't know what diseases they might have. Um, a, a friend of mine had a flock of um, about 80 chickens and they introduced some new birds and they, there was no quarantine. They just introduced them right away. And those new birds did actually have a disease and it ended up wiping out nearly um, all of her flock, nearly 80 birds died. And so, you know, it's really important to, to do that quarantine to make sure that those birds are healthy before you then release them in. All right, so now egg laying uh, practices. So we're egg handling practices rather. And so we've got these uh, healthy environment and these healthy birds that are now laying eggs. So it's important to reduce our risk of becoming sick that we collect those eggs frequently. Um, and there's a, a 10 a.m. rule, which, which generally says that that by 10 a.m. you should have gone down to see if those birds have laid um, and to collect those eggs. Because obviously the less time those eggs are in the environment, the less chance there is for, for them to become uh, contaminated with anything. If we're gonna be cleaning eggs, ideally we'd be doing that with a fine sandpaper or a cloth or a brush. Again, if we've set up our environment so that it's, it's really clean, then there shouldn't be much um, poop or, or anything on those eggs we should be able to clean those relatively easily. Very importantly, we never want to rapidly cool eggs uh, before they're cleaned, right? And the reason is, when we're talking about washing eggs, is that eggs, the, the shell of an egg is a semi-permeable membrane, which means that things can come in and go out of the egg, okay? And so um, what happens is, is if we're washing eggs with cold water, the inside of the egg, um, the yolk and the white and everything that's inside, that is gonna contract and essentially suck in um, anything that's potentially on the surface of the eggshell on the outside, okay? And we don't want that. You know, if there is some poop that's on the outside of that shell, obviously salmonella cells are, are microscopic, we can't see them, but they can certainly uh, get through the, the semi-permeable membrane of an eggshell. They would be walking straight through an open door in that, uh, in that scenario. Um, so what we want to be doing if we're going to be washing eggs is washing them with water that is 20 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than the egg. And it needs to be at least 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And so what this is going to do is it is going to have the opposite effect. That water is going to be hot and it's going to, anything um, is going to be pushed out of that semi-permeable membrane. Okay, so it's really important that if we are washing, we make sure we're washing it with, with warmer water. Uh, we don't want to submerge eggs, again, semi-permeable membrane. So if we're submerging eggs, anything that's in that water could be getting sucked in uh, inside that shell. And uh, we want to make sure for the same reason to dry it immediately. If, if you're using any sanitizers to, to clean those eggs, you obviously need to make sure that those are approved for egg washing. Um, an acceptable solution would be half an ounce of household bleach to a gallon of water. But again, you need to make sure that you're doing the right thing with that. We want to use clean cardboard uh, egg boxes. Um, they need to be visibly clean, okay? So if we're reusing um, egg boxes, egg cartons, we need to make sure that, that they aren't you know, covered in poop. Again, if we were setting up all these things so we have a clean laying environment, those uh, egg cartons are hopefully not gonna get uh, dirty very much. But um, you know, if, you're, if you're thinking of selling these and, and you're asking people to maybe bring back those cartons, you need to make sure that they're clean. Um, it is particularly difficult to, to clean and sanitize cardboard as, as if you use water, obviously it's gonna get soggy. So this may be different in the case of plastic egg containers, 
Um, but we need to make sure that we're putting those eggs into a clean container. And then uh, if we're not going to be using those eggs or, or selling those eggs straight away once they've been cleaned, then they need to be refrigerated to reduce bacterial growth. Uh, in a presentation um, that is on this page as well, uh, in Food Safety 101, I speak a lot about bacterial growth and how bacteria such as salmonella really grows in, in nice warm conditions. Uh, and so if there is any salmonella present in, inside that egg uh, and it's not being refrigerated, it's probably gonna be in a pretty good temperature for that salmonella to multiply pretty rapidly. The final thing we're gonna speak about uh, is personal hygiene, okay? So obviously it's really important that if we're going into these environments, that's okay, we're not saying we, we can't do that, but just to have some common sense about why we do it. So once we've gone and collected eggs, once we've gone and worked with the chickens, all these different things, uh, it is incredibly important to wash our hands, okay? Um, we need to make sure that once we've done that, we've handled anything, that we're going inside and we're scrubbing our hands with uh, soap and water for at least 15 to 20 seconds. Uh, a best practice would be using designated clothing to, to uh, handle any chickens or eggs or anything. So if you're going and collecting the eggs in the morning, you might want to have a pair of boots that are your outside boots that you're not going and, um, and walking, you know, where that chicken poop is and then coming inside. Uh, if you can do that with, you know, if you're using gloves, same kind of deal. We don't want to be going and, and collecting eggs and working with the chickens um, and then using those same gloves to, to maybe, maybe harvest some lettuce or maybe, you know, go take them inside, okay? You want to be conscious of visitors uh, and avoid any unnecessary traffic to that area, okay? You also don't know, we're going to speak about biosecurity in a second, but if people are coming um, onto your property, you don't know what, where they've just been. You know, they might have just been, they might have chickens of their own and, and they're walking through and they might be contaminating uh, where you are. So just be aware of that. You know, really important, we, don't, we want to avoid treating chickens as pets. And as much as they can be, and, and we can name them, uh, it's important that we, we understand that chickens should not be uh, hugged and kissed and cuddled. Um, there, there is the potential for, for those outbreaks that we saw earlier to happen. Um, and, you know, children are particularly susceptible to this because their immune systems um, are not, not yet fully developed. So we're going to transition now from um, food safety for, for our benefit as humans to the, the health and safety of, of your flock. Okay, this is a presentation by Dr. Walters um, from VDAX, and uh, she is sort of an expert in poultry health. And so the conditions and factors that contribute to the development of this disease is obviously we're looking at uh, much the same with humans. We're looking at uh, the genetics of those birds. You know, is it a breed that's predisposed um, to to illness? Um, is the environment? And we've spoken about that. You know, what sort of environment are we creating? Uh, what is their nutrition? They obviously need the energy and the the resources, um, the nutrients to be able to fight any kind of disease. And then you know their immunity. Do they have their ability to to do that? Okay. And so we see down the bottom, um, we have all of these factors multiplied uh, and then you add age to that, which is that A, and that's what creates disease. So in this image here, we, we look at um, the relationship between performance and immunocompetence. And immunocompetence is essentially um, how, what, what ability that bird has to, um, to fight uh, an immune reaction, you know, how competent is their immune system. And so as you can see, if you, if you started along the bottom left uh, and you moved to the bottom right, as performance starts to increase, uh, immunocompetence is going to be reduced. And we'll see why in just a second, but as you can see, when, when performance is really, really high, and by performance, we're talking about egg laying primarily, but we might also be um, talking about meat birds. Um, and as that performance gets really, really high, that means that all of their resources are being used to, to gain weight uh, or to produce eggs. And so they have less resources to fight any sort of disease. And that's what we see on this slide, okay? So in the middle, we have these resources um, and that's a finite amount. And then we have all these different things that 
um, that a chicken would be doing. And in this, or, or, or a duck or any kind of poultry. And in this um, scenario, we see the largest arrow is going towards the growth of eggs. Okay, so this is, these are um, player birds and they're gonna be uh, laying eggs. And so you can see the largest arrow is all the resources, the majority of those are going towards eggs. And so we can see what happens if an infection occurs. So in comparison to these two things, this is the previous slide, we can see that as a, the viral defense comes up, as a virus happens, the um, resources are gonna move away from that egg growth and they're gonna to move towards that viral defense. So egg production will likely decrease, okay? As, um, as the more resources have to go to viral defense, egg production is gonna decrease even more, physical activity is gonna decrease, and also maintenance, so just the ability for them to uh, continue their weight. We can see that if a bacterial def uh, defense is required, um, then this is gonna take a lot of the resources, okay? And egg growth is likely going to uh, dramatically slow, if not stop altogether. And that's the same with physical activity because they need all of those resources. It's the same if you think about it with us. If we get sick, uh, we're probably not gonna go to work. We're gonna stay home in bed uh, we're not going to be going to the gym and, and doing anything like that. We're going to be resting so that our body can use the resources to fight that bacteria. Okay, and as you can see, uh, as this starts to diminish, there are fewer and fewer resources to fight these things, and eventually um, there is the potential for death. But, but the point of this is to show that if you're seeing these signs of reduced egg production, reduced physical activity, that's probably a good indication that they're using those resources to fight some sort of uh, disease. So some of the common signs of, of illnesses, uh, you know, respiratory, we're looking at sneezing, um, swollen sinuses, you know, head shaking, things like that. In the bottom left, uh, we can see an image of a, a chicken with bronchitis. Um, you can see the swelling around the eyes. Um, when we look over on the right hand side, we can see some gastrointestinal signs. Um, so, you know, bloody diarrhea, all of those things there might be some um, sort of illness related to this. So what can we do about it? Or what can you do about it? Prevention is gonna be the best key. Okay, so there are vaccinations that you can do. There's deworming you can do. Um, you know, obviously you need to ensure that they have the correct nutrition. And as I mentioned previously, quarantine is incredibly important. It is so important for us to quarantine new birds to make sure that we're not infecting um, our other our um, yeah, birds that we currently have, okay? So there, um, there are different treatments that we can do. Um, for that, I would direct your, your attention to Dr. Walters and I'll have her contact information up in a, in a few slides. She uh, and the people at the Junior Department of Agriculture are really the experts in, in this sort of treatment and they have uh, veterinary labs that can assist you with that if you have those sort of questions. Okay, but prevention of disease, Really importantly, uh, as I've already mentioned, is biosecurity, okay? That's really helpful for our food safety, but then also important for the biosecurity of your flock. So we wanna keep those clothing separate, as I've mentioned, washing your hands after handling the birds, right? If you're dealing with um, a sick bird, you wanna make sure you wash your hands. It's again, the same thing. If one of your children was sick, you were helping them out, you would wanna go and wash your hands after you go and deal with the other kids. Okay, quarantining, um, again, disinfecting supplies uh, or, or things like that is important. You wanna buy from reputable dealers, um, monitor your flocks for all those things that we've spoken about, okay? Um, and uh, you wanna keep different age groups separate. You know, and that goes back to the, um, the quarantining, you know, because they have different levels of susceptibility uh, and we want to try and prevent access to wild birds because we don't know what kind of disease that they might have. So um, here's the information for some of the regional labs that, that we have in, in Warrington and Harrisonburg. I'm up in Loudoun County in Northern Virginia. And um, these labs do a lot of good work with, with helping that. And obviously, if you have additional questions, contact me. Here's the information for Dr. Walters. Um, and she, she is really, really helpful and she can help you with any kind of questions you might have. Uh, if you have a, a bird that dies um, from an illness, then you might wanna um, investigate that and you can contact Dr. Walters. 
The last thing we're going to speak about uh, is a presentation by Elizabeth Myers from VDAX, uh, and this is the regulations for, for small egg producers all right, in the Commonwealth. Now, uh, I'll preface this by saying the Virginia egg law only covers uh, really large producers of eggs. So if you're talking about backyard chickens, um, we'll see the, at the exemption slide, you really have to be reducing a huge amount of eggs to worry about this. But the principles in this um, are still good and they still apply and we still have to keep everyone safe. Okay, so the, the egg law, you know, it applies to the marketing of eggs, um, you know, the grades, the weights, the labeling, all of those types of things. Uh, so they have to be uh, graded and, and sized correctly. And this is all determined by a process called candling. Okay, uh, you can't be selling um, inedible eggs. So, you know, ones that have blood in them or, or ones that are leaking, things like that. So labeling uh, and advertising obviously is really important. If you go to the store, those, all of those eggs in the store, they're covered by the Virginia egg law, assuming they were produced in Virginia. And um, they have to have the correct grade and the size, um, and they have to be really clearly on there, okay? You know, if you're selling those eggs, if you're covered by this, then you have to produce an invoice that has, you know, your name and address, the quantity of eggs, all of these different, different things for traceability reasons. All right, and this goes back to the containers that we're using. Um, they have to be cl uh, clean and free of foreign odors, you know, so you have to be using clean egg cartons. Uh, you know, if the Virginia Department of Agriculture sees this not happening, they have the, um, they have the right to not allow any of that produce, uh, sorry, any of those eggs that, that are produced to go into commerce. And here is the probably important slide for many of you viewing this uh, when we're looking at the exemptions. Okay, so if you're selling a total of 150 dozen eggs uh, or less a week, then you're exempt from this. So 150 dozen a week, that's a lot of eggs. And so if you're producing less than that, then you're exempt from this rule. Um, and you know, you don't have to worry about it, but you still have to worry about keeping uh, the people that you might be selling your eggs to safe and healthy. Here's the contact information for Elizabeth Myers um, and uh, Pamela Miles, and they run the program down there at uh, Virginia Department of Agriculture. So if you have questions um, about selling your eggs, if you're, if you're getting over 150 dozen a week, then uh, these are the people to contact. If you have any questions, then feel free to reach out and, and contact me. Uh, my email address is on the screen, and so is my phone number. Uh, and with that, I thank you for joining today and um, hope this was helpful.